Could hippos survive the Mesozoic? Hippopotamus amphibious is one of the most recognizable and aggressive forms of megafauna in modern times. Reaching up to 2.6 tons at maximum size, they're the mafia bosses of African river systems. Hippo attacks result in over 500 human deaths annually, thanks to their physical power and incredible aggression. Territorial to an extreme, they'll happily attack and capsize boats, as well as gore whoever was on board. Even lions and Nile crocodiles tend to give fully grown hippos a wide berth. While hippos may be the bee's knees in modern Africa, would they still dominate in a world filled with archosaurian predators bigger than they are? We'll place a population of 500 males and 500 females into the Baharia formation of Cretaceous Africa, a haven for dinosaurian super carnivores. They'll be judged from 1 to 10 on their ability to adapt to their new home, forage for food to deal with their hunger, and confront the hanger of native predators and competitors. Will they thrive? or be eaten alive. Home. How would hippos react to their new environment? For reference, in their Cenozoic homeland, they typically live in wide rivers with easy access to their favorite food, grass. They hang out in the river in big groups, establishing territory and fighting to keep it. The males will also duel for mating rights, which come with a given territory. A dominant bull can mate with the females on his turf and might tolerate younger males in the area as long as they don't try to oust him from his home. The dense herbivores move by using the river bottom as a muddy trampoline, bounding from place to place in the water and surfacing every five or six minutes to breathe. Hippos are found all across Africa today, inhabiting a wide range of freshwater and estuarine habitats from the Congo to South Africa, and that one group in Colombia that escaped from Pablo Escobar's house in the 90s, but we try to forget about them. The Baharia formation doesn't seem too different from what they're used to. A mixture of freshwater, shoreline, and marine deposits, the formation represents a huge ocean's edge floodplain with plenty of conifers and ferns. A 2024 analysis found that across the formation, temperatures ranged from 23 to 35 Celsius, or 73.4 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Nice and cozy. The invasive hippopod would stay far away from the ocean, given their lack of adaptations for saltwater, but would have plenty of space to expand and explore in the rivers of the Baharia. We'll give them a 9 out of 10 for their home score. This new place is quite similar in overall climate and geography to what they're used to, giving them a very strong start. Hunger. Hunger is where things start to get iffy. Hippos typically chill in the waterways during the day and forage for grass at night, with some supplementary intake of aquatic plants. Very rare occasions have been observed of hippos eating carrion or even hunting small animals, but isotopic studies indicate that this is a highly abnormal behavior. Point is, the vast majority of their diet consists of grass. While early grass fossils have been found in China, dating to before the Baharia was deposited, there is currently no evidence for grass having spread to where our hippos need it. That's a bit of an issue considering it makes up most of their diet. But what other options do they have? The Baharia formation was home to water ferns, laurels, and magnolias, in addition to tree ferns and conifers, which would have been the main food source for the sauropods in the area. Desperate for calories and minerals, many hippos may be forced to turn to scavenging or fish eating, but they don't have the digestive apparatus necessary to efficiently process meat. Sticking to water plants and gymnosperm shrubs are their best bet to stay alive, but it'll be a rough time no matter how you cut it. The hippo pod earns a pitiful three for hunger, thanks to how surprisingly specialized they are at eating a predominantly Cenozoic plant, hanger. So far, hippos have rocked at adapting to the climate and absolutely sucked at finding sufficient food. How they react to their competitors and mortal enemies will make or break them. First, some stats. Male hippos have a max size of 2.6 tons, with an average male at 1480 kilograms and average female at 1365 kilograms. Their skin is up to 2.4 inches or 6 centimeters thick, providing an effective defense against contemporary predators. The adults invest heavily in staying alive, which is especially handy given their low reproductive rate. A female will reach sexual maturity at 5 or 6 years old, be pregnant for 8 months, give birth to a single calf, and take an additional 9 months before she can become pregnant again. Given all the effort she put in to make the baby, she guards it and any other young with extreme ferocity in a nursery. Threats to baby hippos include crocodiles, lions, and hyenas, while large Nile crocs hunt individuals as big as adult females while tending to avoid the males. 
that gives us a threshold of around a metric ton needed for predators to consistently pose threats to fully grown hippopotamus. Unless, of course, your Jurassic World Chaos Theory, in which case an admittedly undersized Suchomimus not only fights evenly with a hippo, but can be knocked aside by a kid with a flashlight. Yep, that really happened. Stomatosuchus is an animal worth mentioning. A 10 meter crocodilian, this animal was far larger than any hippo individuals, but likely wouldn't have bothered them. Its teeth were extremely small and its jaw long and scoop-like, perhaps an adaptation for swooping in and swallowing multiple small fish at a time. It has the muscle to prevent bullying from a hippo, but likely wouldn't go out of its way to be aggressive itself. It just isn't interested. Polycotylid plesiosaurs likely fall into the same boat. These brackish water marine reptiles are fast and maneuverable, but too small and specialized in eating fish to want to bother the big plumpy mammals. On land, the medium-sized Egyptosaurus and Decreosaurus would compete with hippos for access to terrestrial plants. Elephant-sized animals, these sauropods were tall enough that they'd likely focus on vegetation out of the hippo's reach anyway, but some overlap may still occur. Paralotitan was far too big and tall to eat the same things, but it could still stomp an aggressive hippo into oblivion. At 27 meters long and up to 30 tons, it was on a level that Cenozoic land animals just never reached. Back to predators. While unnamed, remains of 5 to 6 meter abelosaurids from the Baharia Formation indicate mesopredators that would have been all too happy to chomp down on hippo youngsters. Bahariasaurus and Deltadromias are absolute taxonomic nightmares with nobody really being certain about what they are. As of now, the most likely possibilities are that Bahariasaurus was a 4 to 5 ton Megaraptoran and Deltadromius was a 1 ton Noasaurid. If that's true, then Bahariasaurus would be a tremendous threat to any hippo population, with its size, wicked bite, and large claws, while Deltadromius' tiny skull and elongate build would put it into a non threatening niche. Tamari Raptor Mark Graphi is another story, at 10 meters and 4 plus tons. This taxon is based on recently resurfaced photos of the original Carcordontosaurus material and is now its own genus with a neat little nasal horn. Tamari Raptor would be an absolute menace to hippos that strayed on land. Nearly twice the size of the biggest modern hippo ever recorded, this Carcordontosaurid has the power and weaponry to strike generational trauma into the hearts of these upstart mammals, and was specialized to take down big quadrupeds. Sigilmosasaurus brevicolis and Spinosaurus aegypticus are two more taxonomic messes, and go back and forth between being separate genera or just different flavors of Spinosaurus. The biggest potential Spinosaurus material isn't from the Baharia formation. There is a giant dentary from the ChemCam that overlaps with the holotype enough to say that it probably belongs to Spinosaurus. That provides a potential ceiling at around 14 to 15 meters and 7.5 to 8.5 tons. Either way, these big spinosaurids are going to cause serious problems for the hippo pod. Considering one-ton crocs succeed in taking down adult female hippos, giant theropod versions would have a field day with the incredible blessing of food appearing in their rivers. While spinosaurus may have specialized in eating giant fish, it wouldn't turn down a protein-dense meal well within its capture range. A lone hippo's best chance at surviving an attack from a spinosaurid would be to intimidate it by opening its wide jaws displaying its canines and incisors before the dinosaur figured out what was going on. Hippos now have to deal with significant predation pressure, something that they're honestly not used to. That, combined with sauropod competition for scarce resources, results in a fairly weak 3.5 for their hanger score. Combine their home, hunger, and hanger together, and you result in an overall average of 5.2. That's a hair above the absolute minimum required to maintain a stable population, and quite a bit lower than I expected before researching this video. Depending on grass for so much of their diet hurts them more than any other single factor, and appearing in an environment where multiple predators can easily take them down just makes things worse, despite group behavior. Now, of course, it's time for the speculative evolution variants, a survival trend started by my friend Manly Mesozoic. For those who aren't aware, the two of us, along with the Overseer, are taking on an alien invasion with hybrids of our own design. We've been on the Kawashni ship for a few months now cooking up our hybrids, so keep an eye out. Another disclaimer. These hippo variants aren't necessarily the most likely to evolve, but they are interesting to discuss. Given how much the hippos would struggle in the Baharia formation, we're being very generous by giving them this much leeway in terms of how much they'd adapt. That being said, please enjoy. Speculative Evolution Moore's Barba Cruenta, the Bloody Deathbeard. This hippo lineage migrated to areas of the Baharia where the giant theropods were less common, allowing them to spend more time on land. The lack of predators combined with the absence of their favorite plants, grass, led them to becoming riverside and shoreline scavengers. Their stomachs became far more acidic, ideal for digesting meat. 
and their teeth became better suited for cutting flesh of the sauropod carcasses they encountered. They live alone from infancy, and many subsist by following sauropod herds. They eat not only the corpses of those unable to keep up, but also take advantage of damaged trees and other plants. This scavenging lifestyle requires a high degree of energy investment compared to calories gained, so a typical Moore's barba is smaller than its ancestors. Fully grown Moore's barba are only 200 to 400 kilograms, a fraction of the size of a normal hippo. Much of their mass is invested in fat storage on their back like camels, enabling them to travel long distances between meals. Don't mistake their small size for weakness, however. Moore's barba have powerful bites, up to 12,000 newtons, and males often kill one another in duels when they meet in the spring to compete over mates. Their red beard is dyed such a visceral color thanks to their tendency to vomit out crimson-staining stomach acid as a defense mechanism in the case a big theropod does come calling. The smell is unpleasant, to say the least. Dendrohippus diabolos, the tree horse devil. A small arboreal herbivore with powerful claws, these highly derived hippos are a tad more speculative than the Moors Barba. Shrinking as well in order to cope with the minimal resources, they ended up abandoning the incredibly dangerous river environments where the Spinosaurids ruled, and over millions of years made their way to the trees. Their feet shifted into grips, perfect for tree branches, their bodies became small and limber, and their jaws compacted even further to allow the processing of tough conifer needles and ferns. They're born in treetops, in single calf litters, and live like sloths on fast forward. Adults weigh 20 to 35 kilograms, nowhere near large enough to fight off the abelosaurs and megatheropods that would happily eat them like popcorn. But they don't fight. They've earned the name of devil through another means. Their awful, teeth-shattering, blood-chilling scream. <coughs> <laughs> Dendrohippus took the characteristic wheeze honk of the original hippo population and expanded upon it, gaining the ability to create horrifying noises to ward off predators and even stop sauropods from accidentally eating them while browsing. Some groups have even shown the ability to mimic theropod growls, although it isn't certain if they represent a potential subspecies or simply a unique cultural population. Unfortunately, that ability can also draw attention in precisely the way it was meant to prevent. Temeri raptors have been documented tracking down the dendrohippus screams and then headbutting the trees they hide in, knocking hippos out of the branches and feasting on them when they fall. It's a bit dark, but that's nature. Paeta monstrum giganteus. Uh, sorry, that's just a potato. Uh, that, that's better. The gigantic trap monster. This is a hippo that hunts sauropods. Yes, you heard that right. But instead of taking the route that Alamosaurus did in the Cenozoic, becoming an unstoppable armored murder machine, Paeta monstrum took advantage of their semi-aquatic lifestyle. Their flat feet developed shovel-like claws ideal for digging through mud. Their heads shrank relative to their body, and their stance became more sprawling like a mole's. That made swimming easier, but it also made tunneling easier. Paeta monstrum live in wide rivers and lakes, digging vast networks throughout the surrounding earth. They're sensitive to vibrations and can feel approaching sauropods from miles away. Once they detect the correct stimulus, they go into a frenzy of digging, opening up huge chambers beneath the surface of the weakened, moist soil. Frequently, sauropods walk right past them and are able to take a drink at the river or lake without issue. But when they do step on one of the Paeta monstrum's carefully prepared sinkholes, they collapse immediately and often break multiple legs in the process. The hippo that dug the hole must be prepared to fight off a mob of its opportunistic siblings if it wants first crack at the fresh meat. They are coming. Adult female Paeta monstrum are, on average, 4.5 meters long and 2,700 kilograms, with the bulls reaching 7 meters and 10 tons, with claws nearly a meter long. While not active pursuit predators, they're big and vicious enough that even Temeriraptor and Spinosaurus prefer not to get too close. Thanks for watching! Please consider subscribing and clicking the bell notification icon if you enjoyed this video, and also check out Madly Mesozoic and the Overseer for more time displaced creature scenarios. And if you're into animals from the past encountering modern elements, you'll want to keep an eye out for my Paleo Fantasy series Extinction. The first book, Obsidian Dawn, should be getting a cover reveal here in the next couple of weeks and will be available for pre-order this summer before a November 2025 release. If Aztecs riding raptors and fighting Carthaginians on Carcrodontosaurus sounds interesting to you, you've come to the right channel. Feel free to join the channel to support my work and gain early access to videos at the Megatheropod tier and above, with the Raptor tier receiving loyalty badges and shoutouts. I'm the Vividen, and I'll see you next time. If I'm about to melt, I like swimming but I'm dangerous, if you get too close to me. I might just bite your feet. Hippopotamus, 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 hippopotamus.
Mm-hmm.